Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Caris Circle. Caris Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Caris Books, and Caris Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're very honored to welcome Afiza, Augustus, Jeter, in conversation with Brian Marshall for a discussion of the Black period on personhood, race, and origin, in which an acclaimed poet reclaims her origin story as the queer daughter of a Muslim Nigerian immigrant and a Black American visual artist in this groundbreaking memoir combining lyrical prose, fighting criticism, and haunting visuals. We're really excited to have our friend Maya Marshall back. Maya is the author of the chapbook Secondhand and co-founder of Underbelly, a journal on the practical magic of poetic revision. She has earned fellowships from McDowell, Vermont Studio Center, Kowloon, Watering Hole, Community of Writers, and Kali Khan. Marshall previously served as artist in residence at Northwestern University and as faculty for Loyola, Loyola University. She is the 2021 through 2023 Creative Writing Fellow in Poetry at Emory University. She is the author of All the Blood Involved in Love, which is available for purchase from Paris tonight. And the person of the hour tonight is Hafiza Augustus Jeter, who is a Nigerian American writer, poet, and literary agent, born in Zaria, Nigeria, and raised in Akron, Ohio, and Columbia, South Carolina. She is the author of the poetry collection On American, an NAACP Image Award, and Penn Open Book Award finalist. Her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The Bomb, The Believer, The Paris Review, among many others. The Poetry Committee co-chair of the Brooklyn Literary Council. She is a Breadloaf Catherine Bakeless Nonfiction Fellow, a Kaveh Kanem Poetry Fellow, and a 92nd Y Women in Power Fellow, and holds an MFA in nonfiction from New York University, where she was an accent fellow. Afiza lives in Brooklyn, New York. And we're delighted she flew in for a 24-hour job just to be here with us in Atlanta. So thank you. Thanks to everybody watching. We got a great um, crowd virtually from all over the country, and we're very honored to have all of you who are physically in the room with us. So for everyone, please make yourselves at home, and I'm gonna kick it over to our group. Hello, and thank you, Eva. Hi, everyone in the room. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Hello everyone on the internet. Hello, Hafiza. I'm so Hafiza. glad to finally meet you. Me too, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and say thank you for this book. I was telling you earlier, there's not been in my, in my life a book that I felt more accurately reflected in as a Black queer millennial woman. Thank you. From the South. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for the work that you had to do in, in research and in investigation and in soul searching and emotional growth in order to create this book that only a prose poet writer could make with such beautiful sentences. Um, I said earlier that I see the Black period, the book that you've written, as um, I see its organizing principle as, as locating a global history and, uh, of race and culture and class and ability um, in context of artwork in a single person's body. And that is a Herculean theme. Um, and it's also infinitely readable. It's no small thing to write a 400 page book and have it be riveting. Thank you. So, so well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm happy to be here talking to you a quarter, quarter of the way through the 21st century, uh, our effort interest. Can you tell me what is the Black period? Yeah, so when I, you know, sat down to try to figure out, like, how do I organize all of this, I was thinking of the Black period in two distinct ways. Um, one, in that, like, my father is a visual artist, and he loves Goya's Black paintings. And Goya's back, Black paintings are terrifying. They are essentially, like, the dark heart of man, like, that is subsumed with demons. Um, but my, for my father, he sees that, and he... This whole thing is that he's always said, like, do you know how hard it is to paint in blacks, you know? And so he sees Goya and he sees it's just like a feat of skill. Um, so that right there is a lesson in what you see depends on who's looking and how much information they have and what they're looking at. And then 
too, you know, I was thinking about like the black period in terms of like, you know, when we think of like time. Um, and, you know, the book opens in, at the Grand Canyon at a trip I was taking um, with my wife and my friend Camille and her husband. Camille's parents are here. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about like, you know, I think as Black and African people or just like any anyone who grows up in, in an immigrant family, I think, understands the idea of generations. And so like we live in like, you know, often like your family, like your extended family lives with you. And I remember I saw this uh, or there's this podcast that kind of talks about that, like, you know, what is the span of a lifetime? And just like, you know, think about when you're a child, the oldest person you knew. You know, and then the oldest person they knew, and that is what the span of a lifetime is. So, th trying to think about like, you know, a, like deep time and the space of a single life. You know, especially, you know, as black people, I think when I was doing the math, like looking at my father's life, my father's still alive, um, but the I think the the last person born into enslavement. I, my father was in his teens, you know, and I'm just like, but I'm just like, wait a minute, what is time, you know? Um, and so I was also thinking about it like that, um, but I have a area in the a portion of the prologue, which kind of like describes it that I, I'll just read. Okay. The black period was a state of mind, a position, a duration, something physical to hold in my hands. It was the soil we planted our houses in, the Black period was the entire expanse of what Black adults around me call time and history. It was the stories they wrote and painted inside of us in order that our souls might survive the constant assaults awaiting our minds and bodies. The Black period was something I could render once again. Black people perpetually code switch between different worlds, but in the Black period, we were the default. In the Black period, we were scientists, inventors, singers, poets, runaways, mathematicians, martyrs, abolitionists, and artists. In the black period of my childhood, the houses were smaller than my white classmates, but larger than the shotgun houses my father, his siblings, and their aunties and uncles all seemed to be born in, and larger than the dirt floor house in Nigeria, where my mother took her first breath. In the black period, the stoves never turned off. There is always something cooking in the kitchens. In this world, though hips and knees still hurt, the adults around me relax their shoulders a bit more. The black period was a truth that, in the places I called home, was clear as day. It was as clear as the way Jesus and the church choir could lift my Aunt Sarah's burdens. In the black period, almost any uncle could fix your car. My older cousin Andy could disassemble a military plane and put it back together. In the black period, we were magicians of accounting. We knew how to put even the laziest penny in our pockets to good work. Here, I Liz read more books than even I did. I knew we were a family of records. Thank you. Well said. Um, thank you. I, I... Hearing that definition, we began to think of the black period as a kind of cocoon, space in which to grow safely from the outside world, which is, in all its ways, violent. Um, and it's always it's mobile, and that we can recreate it in our own households, that we're tasked to recreate it with the, the black children and people of color and entrusted to us. Um, but it is made up and be seen and imagined over and over again. You reference Miriam Kaba uh, discussing vision is also a kind of map. And then you ask this question of yourself that I'd like to pose to you here. What is the difference between looking, knowing, and memory? Well, you made that question. Um, I think, you know, that is something that I think that we have to grapple with with whatever we're looking at. Like, um, and the way the book starts, the Grand Canyon, you see the Grand Canyon, and it's just this incomprehensibly beautiful space. Um, and it's a place where you are looking at deep time because through the canyons, you can actually see like the rocks from the beginning of, of, of like the Earth's formation to the present. And so it's one of the rare places you can see time stacked, but also at the bottom of 
the canyon is the Havasuvaj tribe. Um, they're an indigenous tribe that are the first people documented in North America. And there they also have a school where their children uh, attend that's run by the Bureau of Indian Education, it's a government run. And it is essentially the, it's the most under-resourced school in the country. Um, they have sent students to federal prison for pulling a computer cord on the back of a monitor. Um, they, I mean, sometimes there's some resources, under resource that sometimes the janitor has to teach. Um, it's just like kind of just, just like willful neglect, you know. And but when you're at the, and this is at the base of the canyon, and when the, and usually the people only go down there for tours. Um, even the teachers, you know the teachers at the school live there, they fly in and out by helicopter. Um, and you can just be at the top of the canyon and not see any of that. Um, and so I think like that right there is one difference, right? Um, but also when you look deeper, that school and that uh, community, they have recently with the Native American Disability Law Center sued the federal government on behalf of their students to get a uh, complex trauma to be qualified as a disability. So the federal government will have to start actually providing them with the resources that they need because, you know, complex trauma in all forms impacts away the ways that, you know, a child learns, right? And their complex traumas are historical from like centuries of genocide and oppression, right? But they are fighting the, the most under-resourced school in the country is taking on the federal government and they have like they have like they're still in corporate of won a few of their proceedings in which that they have kind of like launched the possibility to change education for every single student in the country. And right, so this is a group that is, you know, one would think would technically have the least power, right? And so you can look at so it's so, so I think that's another layer of looking that you can just be like, oh there's an indigenous tribe down there that, I don't know, it's just a tourist attraction. But then if you look a little harder, they're essentially, you know, fighting for, they're fighting for education on behalf of everyone's children. Yeah, which is a radical undertaking. Yeah. Right? To be a group of people deemed too ineffective, too poor to, to make a title shift. In, in a nation. Um, you think about and talk about looking in more than one way in this book, not least because you were raised by a visual artist who is tested about the task of learning to paint a cloud as accurately as possible, knowing that to be almost out of reach for any, any stable, stable hand. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what made you a maker, how you came to be one who makes in various genres? And also, what radicalized you? I, I see a thread connecting your household and the practice of artwork as a, a life saving technique, but also an activist technique, um, connecting you to the indigenous children in that school, mm -hmm. to the people who are fighting on their behalf. So, again, what radicalized you? How did you become a maker? Yeah, I think that it's one of the, th I think, you know, what radicalized you, that's a, it's an interesting question because it's, I don't know that it was necessarily that I was like radicalized versus my parents gave me the tools to resist indoctrination, um, you know, because this is just the baseline of what we need, you know, um, in terms of just like, just in terms of like healthcare, like uh, just resources, um, just like the baseline. So I don't know if I can say that I'm radicalized, but I think that, you know, growing up, I was raised by people who, who, who this country by design, like intentionally got locked out. My mother was a Nigerian Muslim immigrant um, and my father is a black man born in like Jim Crow, Alabama. Um, his mother had a fourth grade education um, and you know they they immigrated from Alabama to Ohio the tail end of the like of the um, the Great Migration and so 
it's impossible to like look at my family and like not look at history. You can't separate them. And so I think that but like with my father, he was always like remaking the world, right? Because you know, if the way the black and African people are depicted in this country, in this world, is atrocious, right? And so but he's always he imagined us as other things. And so I think that that, um, I think was probably the key part of it. And then my mother, you know, she moved to Akron, Ohio, in like 30 years after the Civil Rights Act. And just, you know, and she's in essentially an African and Muslim woman in the Midwest, right? And so, but during this time, she's figuring out like, how do I, and then she's got two kids already. And so like, how does she give them an origin story? And through the way my mother did it is, you know, we grew up, like she made us celebrate Kwanzaa and I hated it. Um, I was just like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> because I always, I always was it just, it never, like it, that, you know, it, it didn't look like what I saw in my father's family. It didn't look like what I saw in terms of Africa and my mother's family, but I didn't understand the way like their histories were, she was trying to be like, your history is melded, right? Mm -hmm. And so that even if, but like, even if it's not the story, like Kwanzaa wasn't the story I wanted, it's that like, there, it was just an opportunity to be like, but there's another story that you can have other than the one that you're given. Um, and then in terms of like writing, I think that's just like the only thing that I'm really good at. Uh, <laughs> you know, so like you stick with your talents and like I had, um, I had parents who nurtured my talents um, and encouraged me. So I think that that's um, a big part of it. And that the idea that I think I quote uh, Colonel West in here when he's talking about that, um, that like, capitalism produces consumers, right? And that like art doesn't, art produces citizens. Um, and that art, like art is, is an antidote against capitalism, right? It's an antidote against like all the things that is killing us. Um, because when you think about all the things that's killing us, like from billionaires to climate change, just to healthcare, it's all related to capitalism, right? Um, but when you think about the things that can save us, it's all related to empathy, you know, it's the foundational part of that. Well, thank you. I think um, it's not at all radical to think of human beings as human beings. Yeah. And there's a definition of radical that says that one is left of center, one is wanting to reshape the dominant structures, and our dominant structures are trying to kill us. Yes. You writer, artist, descendant of writers and artists and people who are willing to be flexible by necessity and choice, choose to try new structures. That's what I meant by radical mm -hmm. in that circumstance. That's yeah. Um, you asked this question in your book, then I'm going to receive to you again. Did my parents know then that dreaming was a requirement of freedom? At least me to the question, what is the Afrish futurist relationship to shame, to forgiveness, to imagination? This is a much yeah. 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 yeah, I think that what I land on, I think, you know, really like Land Square on how Bell hooks kind of present shame and that like it's a tool of white supremacist patriarchy and that like shame produces paralysis. And so you know, when you think about all the things that you're ashamed of um, about yourself, and you think about like, so starting to ask like, who is your shame in service of? Because it's not in service of ourselves. So like, who is it in service of? And just like, the, the common denominator is America, you know? Um, and America is like the, the most crushed, one of the most crushed systems in like the universe. Um, and so I think that in terms of, like I say, like one way I think this this book like um, radicalized me. I can say that like in terms of like it led me to square to like really be committed to like the work of abolition, right? Because I think it's either Angela Davis or Rand Paul. I need to look this up. Who says um, you can't transform the world without you know expecting yourself to transform? 
you know, and having to think about what parts of you do you need to transform and so you're not working in service of, you know, the, what is oppressing you. Um, and I think that, like, a very tangible way that we can see that is in three unions, right? Um, the, that even though billionaires are exploding somehow everywhere, there's a billionaire every minute, um, but yet there's also, I mean, Home Depot has a union, Starbucks has unions that like, that are also, that you see like 18 year old white girls, like, like, you know, working alongside, you know, 18 year old immigrants. And you see this really unifying moment in terms of people, you know, coming together to resist. I think that unions are like a really like like a really interesting thing that's happening right now in this moment. Um, I think it was imagination. And what is what is the relationship between you know, Afrofuturist and imagination? I think that like um, it's almost like a one to one that because like this I mean like this country never expected black people to survive you know um, and I think that one of the reasons like at least my dad always shows that like. One of the reasons, you know, white power structures like are constantly like just like suppressing black joy is because they can't understand how we could possibly have anything to laugh about after all they've done to us. You know, they just like can't, they're just like, how is that possible? And it's terrifying, you know, like how we can have so have joy. And so with this idea of just like, you know the path before us is empty because we're not supposed to be here, but like you imagine the bridge as you walk it um, and then the bridge appears, you know? And I think that that's like kind of what we do because in terms of like my family, I'm probably, like my, me and my sister's generation, like we're essentially the first generation who, who were able to or like participate in a world that was mainly white without having to clean it, you know? Um, and so there's no, there's no, there's no roadmap for us, you know, where like some kids might go like, dad, I want to be a banker. You've been a banker. Grandpa was a banker. He's JP Morgan. What do we do? You know, just like your keys, you know, you have, you have a roadmap, but I think that in order to survive this country, we, you know, we give each other the roadmaps we have through like, you know, like we warn each other about like the dangers of cops, the dangers of the state. Um, but then also yeah, the part of that roadmap is you have to constantly invent because this, because we live in a world that's trying to unimagine us. Trying to embrace us. Yeah. That limit in every structure. So collective action, collective witness, um, and building in our own communities is what, what imagination has to do with the future. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. You reminded me of a section in your book where you write about uh, voting as an act of imagination, voting as a, an act of hope for future generations rather than being an investment in the state because the state will try to kill us no yeah. what we do. Um, you also write about resonance. You write about it in the context of going to a giant cathedral on this backpacking trip through Europe um, and feeling sound rise up and resonate because of the uh, hardness of the ground and the height of the ceilings. And you say that sound can be sacred in this section about queerness, uh, which for me immediately puts me in a dance floor, immediately puts me in a, a, a queer dancing place that is, you know, the replacement for church when I needed a replacement for church. Um, I wonder what to you is queerness and what is the safer I have to do with community? Well, I think that, okay, in terms of what is queerness, I think it's it's hard to define because it's kind of like, you know, what is blackness? I think just like whatever is inside of a black person um, within reason, because we know we have some folks that need to be called back. <laughs> um, um, but in terms of, I think that like, I think it's, I guess it's almost a question like, does it matter? You know, it, I think that it is, it is in terms of just like the functional sense, 
it is a definition in which like is used to oppress but it's also a way in which we use to create community it's also a way to um a way that you live in resisting structures um but like i don't you know i think it's i think it's hard for me to say that but i think for me it was a place where i could it was a, it's a place where you can I, it was a shameless place you know um to be on the other side of all that you internalize in terms of you know how a country gets you to be your own worst enemy but i think you know if anything is it's community this in the same way blackness is and then the other question was Answer to me says greatness is not a monolith. Yeah. Um, there are other answers in it, right? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a, you know, in a black family as a not straight person? And that's some of what you take up in the book. Um, I was asking about community, which is mm -hmm. where you where you took us. Um, and I think that you've implied a kind of faith in shared struggle. Um, so a question I have for you then is, how did you go about doing the research for this book? What is the, what is the function of activism in your life and in the work of writing? Yeah, so I think you know, the first uh, chapter of this book that I wrote was the Theater of Forgiveness piece chapter, and it is about my aunt Sarah, who I had a very difficult relationship with. Like, um, she was my mean aunt, um, and for some reason, as a child, she like she made it kind of like her mission to torture me, and she was really, really cruel to me. Like, never like physically abusive, but just like, emotionally cruel. And we would have to go visit her every Easter, and it was just like terrible. And finally, like we told my parents, like they never made us go back there again. But then, like we told me, so still took me on a vacation, but I was never sent back there, like alone with her again. But you know, it really after a while, you know, my father really wanted a like repair relationship, and it really made me think to say, like, okay, what is forgiveness? You know, and you know what. Like, why, why do I have to, why, why me? Why do I have to be the one to forgive? But at the, the time that I was kind of like grappling with this, it was also the time of the Charleston shooting, um, the Charleston church shooting. And shortly after that, there was, you know, the news interviewing black people, all the, the, the uh, families, the victims, and, you know, especially after hate crimes, media loves to ask black people if, they, if we're forgiven yet. You know, like with minutes of it, and you know the the some of the family members of the family members who Dylan of the, of the people Dylan Roof killed did forgive, and you know it really made me think of the way forgiveness forgiveness as is like a tool of Christianity because you know my me and aunt was also deeply spiritual um we were in like whenever we were visit her we were in church morning and night just singing the choir we to, she taught sunday school her like my uncle raj was a deacon um and thinking like how what are what are these two antagonisms but like thinking okay like how do i put my aunt in context and having to think about like the life that she led like she and my father and his sisters had a difficult life. They, like my grandmother's life was marked by abuse of men, um, including like uh, my aunt's like grandfather. And so they were they were raised in, in terror. And while I don't know what it is that made my aunt like kind of like psychologically choose me to terrorize, you know, trying to understand like the legacy of enslavement and racism that made the men that made her it made like the environment around her and trying to think is there room for forgiveness in that um and who is our forgiveness for and and like can we is it possible to like 
hold on to our souls and not forgive. And so what is the purpose of anger? And I think that like anger is pretty powerful because the people who like, I've never heard anyone tell a white man not to be angry ever in my entire life. Like um, even when this is it's a mass shooting, they're sad, not angry, you know, but women, people of color, people were the ones told not to be angry, right? When anger is just a way to draw your line. And so really thinking of like my aunt's like anger as just like who, how many times had her line been crossed and how, and, and what was she using me as a substitute for? And while, you know, that like, you can't count on like some exchange of forgiveness in order to forgive all the time. And so trying to really grapple with that. And so for that, like, you know, I read a lot, that was really kind of looking into the personal work of abolition. So I read a lot of Angela Davis, Mary Okawa, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, just looking at like, okay, like who gets to hold the monopoly on violence, right? Um, and that, um, what do we get by, like, what if we just, made forgiving white supremacy white people's issue and we just said not it you know and um to move our attentions to other things you know but like but also so it's really trying to just like grapple with that and essentially like how not to want retribution for what my aunt did to me for my aunt and essentially like how to forgive her for like the cruelties that she expressed to me but that were also like complicated um, and so I looked at a lot of research into the, the psychological way people who, who, who've been abused internalize rage and um, perpetuate the work, uh, like the offenses of their abusers. And so there's a lot of psychology, a lot of um, looking into just like the, the legacies of enslavement. Because, like, you know, my father, to remind her, just like, look how light your skin is. You know, like, that's, your, that's the work of the country. Um, so yeah, so I think like, so that was just like one example of the research, but for others, like, you know, involved researching like linguistics for looking at how like language is used as a tool of oppression. Um, I mean, I think I literally researched everything. Um, I was just in books for two years. Yeah, it is clear. <laughs> and you, I mean, you've really documented well, right? So this is. This is a book that will be a tool to a lot of people because you cite everyone and in the, in, the, in the body of the book, right? Yeah. I'll do a little digging for the yeah. members, but that's all right. Yeah. Um, I, you know, forgiveness and anger have all sorts of uses and they've both been made into weapons. So choosing to live in the cocoon of the black period and use them for healing within our family communities is like a, it's a protective posture, um, and it's one of the last for continued expectation of a, of a successful future of yeah. the macro futures mission that you've outlined. Um, there is a moment in the book where you talk about going to a friend's house and having a beer on the porch and him saying, I'm so, you know, you're talking more about forgiveness. It comes up several times in the book alongside shame and, and freedom and joy. Uh, and he says, I'm so sorry, your mother is not, is going to go to hell. Um, yeah, she wasn't a kind of the issues with her. Yeah. Yeah. I think regularly about the question of why uh, oppressed people don't burn it all down. And mm -hmm. one of the main reasons is that we have to live here. You know, there's not some place else to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, Forgiveness allows for enough uh, mission in a day for us to, to live another day and to protect what it is we actually yeah. have some control over. Uh, I wonder where you see, and maybe the teachings of Marion Carter or Angela Davis, um, in this evolution of having to change as we transform the world around us, the uses of forgetfulness or revision or remembering, like where this revising our old methods serve us as we work in small communities to make local change? Big question, I'm trying to narrow it. 
we have to be willing to forgive ourselves. We have to be willing to be wrong in solidarity with those that are also oppressed. That includes sort of disability justice, mm -hmm. the folks that you were talking about. It includes the indigenous populations that are parallels with impoverished black people um, in your book. And that means a kind of patience, it means a kind of protection that I think fall into the functions of forgiveness. But there seems to be an irresolved ambivalence in this book around how forgiveness functions um, from where do you think it is useful outside of the church? Where is forgiveness useful outside of the constraints of a white Christian? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think it's it's most useful in the community. I think like, and this is, you know, I think like central to the work of abolition is not necessarily maybe about forgiveness, but it's just like that justice doesn't have to be gotten through retribution. Um, and that we, and that like, we're in a system that teaches us to be hungry for punishment. Um, and so I think that, you know, but I think we, we forgive, like forgiving is the thing that we do all the time. You know, we forgive each other all the time. Like, I mean, if we didn't, like parents and their children wouldn't have relationships, <laughs> you know? Like we would have all cut each other off a long time ago. Um, like no one would talk to their siblings ever again, <laughs> you know? Um, and so like we, under we, we understand forgiveness, um, but like we also understand limits um, and there, it, it, but like I think it's like the, we, it's our country that's always pushing our limit, you know, in terms of, and like, and also I try to navigate in the book that like um, forgiveness requires accountability. Um, it requires uh, like taking account for this, and then you know, this country's never taken account for like anything. I mean, Obama apologized for indigenous genocide ish, like, I think. A little bit, but a little, but like so, something, you know. Like, we have to account for that also. Yeah. And that's not something we're afraid of as a nation. Yeah. Uh, I will ask you questions for the rest of our working lives if you're down with that. Right now, I think it's time to let these children's human beings ask us ask them some questions. So um, let me give you a moment if you want to say anything good before we turn to them. Um, I'll just add one that when you were asking me about the, what is it, the work of activism in my work, I think that like uh, activism is a very specific skill that I do not have. Um, that like, that is not my work. My work is to be a writer, but I think for me, the mission of this book was to essentially try to figure out like, what is it that we're looking at? And to take all these sources because you know, like, I can't, you can't expect people to have the time to do what I did, <laughs> you know? Like, people have kids, they have other things, that other attentions that need to play. And so I think my work is to be like, how do I make some of this more complicated stuff? Like, how do I explain it to myself enough time that I can make it accessible? Um, the, and how, how this is all interwoven? Um, because I think I really wanted to make it so the people I'm talking about can access the book. And so I think I see, you know, try, I try to be a translator, like a humble translator. So I think mean, that's where I see it. Um, I love this idea, just the sort of Frarian practice, the popular education model to say the people I'm talking about should be able to read yeah. the book, access to the book, see themselves reflected, like contribute. Um, if there are ways in which we can make that happen, let us know. You know, I'm happy to teach it. Happy to, happy to put it in the community center. Happy to send people copies. We'll be buying this book and sending them for Christmas. That's right. Yeah. Let's have arguments and Thanksgiving dinner too. Let's do it. Um, again, I want to say thank you for your attention, for your conversation, and then open up the room to questions for Tisa. And thank you so much. Thank you, you too. Um, my name is Jalia, and I'm actually a documentary filmmaker, so coming to this event is just so eye-opening and it's given me such information um, for my docuseries that I'm currently working on. 
But I wanted to ask you, you all mentioned tools. So I wanted to ask, when we think about like the master's tools, what are our tools that we can use to like counteract that? I mean, I think I just fall back on community every single time. I mean, it's literally like the strength in numbers. That's why, I mean, this is why they try to so add like crush unions, right? Because communities actually can create a massive effect. It's why they try to violently like quell protests um, because they try to make organizing illegal. Like that when, when people get together, like change does happen, like black people are proof of that, you know? Um, and so I think that, yeah, the tool is kind of community and really everyone doing like everyone doing what they can and what they're able to like not everyone can march not everyone can can like uh be an organizer because there's like a commitment and a skill that like, you really need to pay attention to um so i think it's like bringing all of our skills and being able to work you know like cross community to create change and i also think not compromising i think we've compromised enough Sure. Yeah, I mean, I will only add that um, that showing up and continuing conversations that, you know, making your protest music, making your artwork, distributing those things, showing up in classrooms in the ways in which we can, showing up in spaces of any type of education outside of formal institutions. Those are our tools, right? You're, you're talking about Audre Lorde saying the master's tool will never dismantle his house. Well, Francis' book argues that we get to create the black period. We get to create our own houses to insulate us. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it takes off from this position that Tony Morrison gave us, which is that racism is a distraction. Mm -hmm. So focusing yeah. on our work, like that's, that's the tool. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Or maybe comment? <laughs> Jump in. Do you want to tell us about your doctor, Dr. Sanders? Yes. <laughs> there was a documentary about. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, well, my doctor series is called America Show Me Your Hands. And um, for the first four episodes, I cover um, immigration. So I am two, the daughter of um, Sierra Leonean immigrants. Um, and then the second one deals with beauty standards, ideals. Um, third is education, and really, um, I bring on my family member for each episode. So for the one in education, I speak with my nephew. His name is Prince, and he's a 10-year-old fifth grader. And we're really talking about his experiences in school because of COVID, but also mm -hmm. he's starting to like have that like tug of war with teachers mm -hmm. that I didn't really experience growing up, but like now that I hear him talk about his experiences, it makes me think back to being in the classroom and when certain things would happen, like, it just gives more context to things. And then the fourth one is um, social media and the internet. So, yes. Um, all of those will be through the Black Lens. It will be through um, a young Black Lens, me, my Black Lens, but also bringing on my family members to tell their lived experiences and then having like expert like professionals speak to it and give it that credibility mm -hmm. um, that it needs. So yeah. Thank you. Nice so back to your question of the tools, like various sources lend credibility. Our stories, our household stories, our household languages, the short hands, our home videos, which he says she used to write a bunch of this book, are credible. Yeah. We are a nation, a set of melded nations, a pan African and Black American community uh, held together by oral histories and multiple and still happening migrations. And that's legitimate all the time. Thanks. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Afiza, since you did so much research and, and melded so many different sources for this book, was there a particular book or source that really surprised you or? offered some kind of insight that you was really unexpected? 
I think that one of just like amazing to see that every question I had that someone was on it. Like I think that like I think that that's like maybe one of the tools is to like pay attention to what other people are doing because I think that you know I've said this and I've talked to people previously that writing this book made me like a deep optimist because I mean everywhere you look like someone is trying. You know, and like that's actually pretty incredible. And you know, one of the things that uh, like abolition, like like talks about is when someone just like, oh, okay, but like, what do we do with rapists? What do we do with prisons? It's just like, okay, but the idea is, what do we do? We do anything else. We try anything else. Just like, you got an idea? Let's try it. Because what are what do we have to do if if the one option we take off is collaborating with our oppressors? You know, like, what can we invent if that's the one thing we say we're not allowed to do anymore, you know? Um, so I think just, like, paying attention to what other people are doing is, like, has been the most inspiring thing. Because I think that, like, um, Graham Cobb says, like, hope is a discipline. And I think, like, hope is a tool um, because you, you have to believe in both, like, the impossible and the possible. And just thinking that, like, you know, for the first time, like, an African person was kidnapped to America to the moment we got free. Every day someone believed black people would get free, right? That's like incredible um, for centuries every single day. And they had no proof like um, in either direction for so long. Um, and I think that what one can do in community with hope, um, especially because like in general, people do want people like, in the community, like we want each other to be all right. Um, and then, you know, and so I think kind of working together to make that happen, I think is the tool. It's like what, and the tool is very specific to what your community needs. And I think that, that's why like, uh, you know, having like local activism is like really important. Um, I'm just going to ask, you know, I was having a conversation with my, my undergrads this week and they wanted to think about, talk about how a book can be in community with other people. Um, I need to not talk about it in the dry sense of the bibliography, but in the active sense of, of you know, looking and seeing what everyone else is doing, that someone else is already on it. Um, I want to ask which books you would recommend. The ones I see you referencing the most are Marian Cabo's We Do This Only For Us and Harsha Wally's Order and Rule. Yeah. What else would you add to that? I mean, definitely Harsha Wally's Order and Rule, I think it's like the most incredible book ever written. Um, let's see, I'd recommend, I mean, I think the, the podcast still processing is incredible for the way it melds pop culture, politics, race, and even some more like esoteric things. Um, I think it's like incredibly woven and well done. Um, a book that, well, it's not in here. I don't know if I put it in here, but I read it while I was editing. Is the dawn of everything, and it is. It's. I mean, it also, I read the audio book because the book is about this thick. Um, but it's essentially re looking at all of history as essentially that you know we look at. We've been told that history shows that essentially as people, we rip each other apart. And that is, that is human nature, but it looks at like the proof that we have for this, and like we actually don't have the proof. The proof throughout history actually shows that people lived in the community, they supported each other, that when someone couldn't work, the rest of the community just like took care of them. Um, that that in, ter in terms of this, like we're essentially just like living in a bad story that like someone, like the bad story of John Locke or something. Um, and that like, this isn't actually how it, it's supposed to be. And so I think that that book is um, pretty revelatory in terms of just like, that like, if this is just a bad story, can we turn the story around? And there's nothing more powerful than there, of course. Right? right. That's, yeah. That's the Africa Futurist Project of Imagination. Yeah. I think in terms of books I recommend, I think you should. You're the editor at A Market, which is an incredible publisher if people don't know them. A Market books, the leftist socialist press based in Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> uh, we publish political nonfiction. Is that a book club? We do have a book club. Can't afford not to buy it. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's 
that's the part of why I signed on. I was like, this is a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> there, there will be many books here. At yeah. the but they'll also be inspiring. We republished the autobiography of Angela Davis, mm -hmm. which was originally edited by Tony Morrison. It's in front of this building. You can buy it on Harris's website. Oh. Um, also, Harsha Wallace's Border and Rule, which really is incredible. There are recently held um, the 2022 Socialism Conference in Chicago two weeks ago. And she gave a, uh, a talk alongside Robin D. G. Kelly, also incredible. There's a keynote also available on um, in Marcus podcast from Ruth Lee Wilson Gilmore. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such incredible work happening. Not the least of which, I mean, really, and, and this is one that's sort of back to us, keeping in their back pocket is Rayleigh and Kava's We Do This Till We Us, which is a, an activist tool to abolitionists to organize. Anyway, I think that the other was going to ask a question. Really good. Well, I was interested in your process. I keep looking at, at your book, definitely. I've enjoyed listening to your, your uh, your thoughts, and Thank your you. thoughts about others' thoughts, <laughs> your, your thoughts about the collective. So I imagine you in a solitary process, and you're thinking about the world, and you're thinking about community, very uh, extroverted, introverted exercise. Can you tell us a little bit, because I'm interested in writing a book, or several, how, how do you write? Because my goal is to write book maybe half of that. <laughs> But, I, you know, I sit down to write a paragraph or two, and I have so many thoughts swimming, and I get overwhelmed, and I'm like, okay, I need to make some tea. And then I need to call somebody. <laughs> and that's it for today. Can you tell us a little bit about your process to write such an impressive book of so many deep thoughts and the thoughts of others, uh, curated and refined yeah. through your own mind? Sure. I mean, I think for a lot of it, it was, there was a good question in my mind that I like, couldn't figure out. Um, and I'm just like, and it was really easy to be like, how, like so many of these were like, how do I answer these questions for myself? Like the, there's a chapter in mean, the second and third chapters of the book um, kind of deal with, with Islamophobia and it really, I kind of just like kind of my mind it's like, okay, I understand that as an American, war is both one of the most invisible and most defining parts of like my life. Like everything in here is like a product of war somehow. And like I literally just went over to my friend Camille and just like Camille war. And it's like she just made her talk the whole thing out with me. Um and so a lot of it is done in community and just like having people to like help you kind of like figure out what it is you, like you're thinking um and then like i think that i kind of just my kind of trick is i literally just pour as much information in my head until i feel like i'll explode and so like i'll just like listen to podcasts um i'll watch tv um and then in, i think that in terms of when i get to the Page. like it doesn't matter if it comes out linearly or not just like write it as it comes out and then I open like a new blank doc and like organize it that way um and I have like a, an app that reads text to you so I have it read back to me so it feels like it's kind of like outside of me um so I think like that helps um but I think that really kind of I think making sure I think what the key is like I'm like going in not knowing what it is you expect to find. You know, I think you have to leave a surprise in there for yourself um, and kind of make it just like, okay, like that like this is supposed to be an excavation. Like you're you're not supposed to know where you're going. And so like if you don't know where you're going, you're on the right track. Yeah. Are there other questions from I wanted to ask if you could hold up the book and speak to the beautiful cover art and maybe shout out the artist. Yes, the artist is my father, Cameron Jeter. Um, he's a painter and visual artist. And there are, he did the cover image. And there are like about 60 
of his images throughout the book, including two color inserts in here somewhere um, that go throughout. So this is essentially like, like his art from a, so before I was born, like not all of it, but before I was born to like 2022, it spans. Can you speak just a moment to your artistic relationship with your artist friends? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things where we grew up and there was just art everywhere. It's like leaning against the walls. Like if there was a room someone wasn't sleeping in, it became storage for art. Um, and I think that, I think I just like, I grew up seeing us retranslated over and over again because like he usually used our family or people in the community as models. Um, like he also illustrated children's books and a family and sister model for the children's books. Um, and so I think that in terms of relationship, you know, I can literally remember certain parts of my life by like, I can look at a picture and know what house we lived in. Um, I can look at like one of his styles and like know what was going on those years, you know? So it's, it's like almost like a visual timeline of where we were, when we were, who was alive. Um, yeah. It makes so much sense that yeah. they are punctuating a memoir. Yeah. Are they in chronological order or are they in order according to the narratives that they're placed next to you in the book? I just kind of did it by feel. And it kind of worked out, it, which is just like kind of nice to see that, like, okay, like, you know, you really are, you're really am my father's daughter, you know, because like I'm writing about shame. I'm like, oh, put this one, it's literally called shame. I'm just like, I guess, I guess I was listening. <laughs> that's my favorite ending. I, <laughs> I mean, that's a perfect place to wrap it up. So, uh, I want to say thank you to all our friends watching virtually at home. You can buy the black period on personhood, race, and origin from Karis by clicking the teal link at the bottom of your screen. You can also support Karis uh, Circle, our nonprofit, um, by clicking the donate button. Thank you to everyone who participated online. We're going to say goodbye.